for him. Lieutenant Colonel David Dopwell retired, enlisted with the West India Regiment in 1958 until 1962. He then enlisted in the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force on July 23, 1962 until November 18, 1988. He then became senior military, senior military and from 1970 to 1975, he was an intelligence and security officer within the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. Then from 1977 to 1979 was the second in command in the 1st Batta Battalion with the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment and in 1981 was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Hmm. Also in 1981 he was attached to the Antiguan government as commanding officer. He formed he formed the Antigua Defense Force from Antigua's independence from 1982 to 1983. He was the commanding officer, 1st Battalion, Trinidad and Tobago Regiment, and served to support the, battal the battalion from 1983 to 1986. He was, in the staff, he was the staff officer administration for regiment headquarters, Trinidad and Tobago Regiment. He also acted as commanding officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment in 1988, and also in that same year, acted as chief of defense staff. He had both military and civilian training in England, a platoon commander's course and weapons instructor's course in 1962, all arms course in 1968, Command and Staff Course from 1975 to 1976. Back at home, he trained from Project Management in 1984, Incident Management in USA, and in 1985, he came back home again and trained in Terminal Management at the Coast Guard in 1987. He received his education and obtained Senior Cambridge completed in 1958, Royal Military Academy in the UK in October 1959 to December 1961. Staff College in Surrey, England from October 1975 to November 1976. His post military accomplishments were with Mustafa Group of Companies and Dubco Contracting. He has a variety of extracurricular activities, hobbies, mainly in sports together with woodworking hello, and is a member of the Trinidad Tobago Orchid Society. He has a great sense of humor, as you would see, and is happily married. Welcome to the podium, Lieutenant Colonel David A. Doctor. Oh, you said it? I think, well, uh, no, 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 no mic, no mic, no mic. Okay. We don't need it. I haven't got too many people here. They can all hear me, can't you? Oh, yes, sir. Well, after all of that, I don't know what I have to say much more. I don't know. I mean, I could go for elections now. Um, okay. In fact, we're here. One of the reasons that I am. Um, what's the right word? Offered to speak this evening, really, was that there have been two books written about the 1970s. Mutiny, as it was called. I don't consider it a mutiny, frankly, but I'll, we'll come on to that later. Um, by people who were not there. They were never there. And some of them heard things, others things. And um, as one, the author of the last book told me, he tried to make the men look good. Now, I wondered, when I read the book, I wondered whether I was in the same force and, and knew what was going on. I mean, I obviously had been sleeping all the time, you know, and things were going on around me, I didn't know. So, in fact, I, my good friend here, Wendell, who had been with me right through from the beginning, um, I asked him and we decided that we would try to enlighten you folks on the, what really happened in a sense, and the background to some of it. So, in fact, I will start with a little piece of the background, not everything, I can't give you everything, but I'll give you a little background to what just before the 1970, uh, the 21st of April, and how it all came about. So 
I'm going to read more or less just so we get it straight. The troubles in Tetron in the 1st Battalion, because at that time we just had the 1st Battalion of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment, started sometime before the 21st of April 1970. The Black Power Movement in Trinidad and Tobago was growing stronger and there were signs of support within the force also. The men were complaining about conditions and the poor pay. As a result, two soldiers under the adjutant, Captain Brown, were tasked to get information, and we used to call them I spy and all that, jokingly. They were Sergeant Skeet and Private Roberts. In fact, they did a great job, but you know Trinidadians like to talk, so really you can't keep too many secrets in this country. And informed the commanding officer of the of the a likely attack on Tetron Bay by the Black Power Movement. And also they, they gave him certain other information about some officers who were allegedly um, associated with the movement and had been going to meetings and things like that. Now, as a result, I was given the task of moving the ammunition from Tetron Bay clandestinely, as secretly to St. James Barracks, and the commanding or, or, um, officer ordered all ammunition taken from our stores. So you, you may not know, but in the regiment, for emergency purposes, each company would have um, stores on standby for training and for um, an emergency or, or, or wartime practices, as they want to call it that. All the ammunition in Tetron Bay was placed in the bunker. That's a, you'll hear more about the bunker in a little while. Only the guard room had 40 rounds of ammunition for the guard in an emergency. I was very unhappy about this because soldiers without ammunition or arms are useless. And um, it's only good if you can defend yourself. And I felt that even if there was some, now they didn't tell us everything. Now remember at that time I was just a captain, staff officer in the uh, training wing. They kept all the information up on top. Some of these things I learned afterwards, but I knew. So we were sort of in the dark, but this was happening. But I felt, I, I knew of the sort of undercurrent that there was something up. And, but I felt it was ridiculous to take away the ammunition from the soldiers and just because some of the soldiers might be bad, just keep your eyes out. Anyhow, it was done. Frankly, I was fortunate because as the officer in charge of the ammunition and what have you, I was permitted to keep a pistol with 12 rounds. <laughs> um, and um, also what I did, because I was fortunate to have the cream of the crop. I have 77 fellas under my, um, under my charge as a training wing. We were, I had the best soldiers in the, in the regiment at that time. Maybe Wendell will argue about that, but that was in Bravo Company. I was training wing. And, but those fellows were really good. And what I told them, I said, look, chief, if they take away all your ammunition and these people really come over and capture you, just put up your hands quietly and volunteer and say, right, I'm with you. And um, do guard duty. And when night comes, you know where you're going to find me. I was used to be called Lobo. So I said, they're not going to catch Lobo. So you know where I will be outside. They'll meet me outside. And you know, funny enough, if that really happened, but then you will get on to that later. Um, so in fact, what happened, they took away all the ammunition from us, but on doing, we were still doing range work. And what happened, the rebels, as we were, I prefer to call them, actually stole ammunition when they were on the range, hid it away. And so at the time, the 21st of um, April, they actually had 20 rounds between all of them. And those 20 rounds of ammunition is what stopped the whole of Tetron <coughs> and had people like Wendell and others under and myself in grip as the same goes. Right. Now I'm going to go on now with what actually took place. That was just sort of beforehand. What actually took place on the 21st. Right? On Monday night, this is on the 20th now, on Monday night at about 10 o'clock, 
um, Colonel Johnson called me at home and invite, told me that to come to his house right away. When I got there, uh, he was living in Federation Park, I live in Trinity City. Yeah. <laughs> so, he said, come in civilian clothes. When I got there, I met uh, uh, Major Luke um, and some other officers, I can't remember all of them now right now, yeah? but OC Alpha and so forth. And he then briefed us and said the Prime Minister decided to call the state of emergency the foreign day. <coughs> right? Now, I just want to digress a little bit, because later on I discovered that uh, the old Eric Williams had found, had knew that they had planned to do the Black, the black Power Movement, plus the people in the regiment had planned to do their thing on the 23rd. So he pulled the plug before, and um, we had, we were then briefed at what we would do on, the, on that next morning. Meanwhile, the police were briefed to arrest Granger and all of them and hand them over to the Coast Guard, <laughs> <laughs> who took them down to Nelson Island or what have you. But what was going on in Tetron is what I am about to continue with. Um, so the Colonel Johnson briefed us and told us what we had to do. Um, while planning the, our operations, a lot of time was spent on deciding where Lieutenants LaSalle and Bazi, this is important, should be assigned so that they could not be influenced any description of the operation, as the commanding officer had prior information which reflected the possibility of their involvement in the Black Power Movement. Mention was made of Lieutenant Shah, but it was felt that being with me in Tetron on his own, he would be ineffective. Information of Lieutenant Shah, as far as I know, was very scant in respect of his association with the movement. But he was very close to these officers and it was felt to support, uh, that he would support any of their actions. At this briefing, it was decided to, to dispatch Lieutenant LaSalle as liaison officer to the Coast Guard, whose duties were coastal patrol in this operation, and Lieutenant Bazi was to remain with me at Tetron Bay. I left the commanding officer's home at 6.30 a.m. on Tuesday, the 21st April, and went to Camp Ogden at Long Circular to bring the volunteer company up to date with the state of emergency and to change into uniform. And having previously called Captain Spencer, who was my second in command, I was also to meet him to give him instructions so that he could have things going smoothly in Tetron Bay. While I spoke to the volunteers and made on the spot arrangements, all these things was in fact done at the time. I left Camp Ogden at approximately 7.30 on the set Tuesday, the 21st April for Tetron, arriving around 8 o'clock. On arrival, I saw the battalion on the square being addressed by the second in command, Major Christopher. <coughs> Now, um, I need to say here, because a lot of talk was made about why Colonel Johnson was not in Tetron Bay at the time of the um, thing. But in fact, once the state of emergency was called that morning, he was the Joint Chief, and his station was supposed to be police headquarters. Um, the battalion was handed over to Major Christopher. So he was, in effect, the commanding officer in Tetron Bay. Uh, um, at the time, I was very driven by my driver, Private Roberts, who had met me at Camp Ogden. I went straight to the training wing, Armory um, first, to secure some pistols that I had removed from Camp Ogden for safekeeping, and secondly, to inform the storemen present of the state of emergency in so far as it affected them. I then went to my office, accompanied by Private Roberts, and left my civilian kit and bag and then went across to B Company's office. Now I'm reading all this because this is what, in fact, the statement I gave in court. And um, I'll put in little things which they told me I couldn't put in in court. <laughs> because, no, in court you have to say exactly yeah. what you saw. Not what Wendell yeah. told me yes. or Jack told me or when I went to Coast Guard and I met uh, Walker, he told me what happened to him and so forth. So, 
But um, I, I saw the <laughs> um, well, this was, where was I? Yes. Yeah, I went to my office. Now, in those days, I was the, um, as I said earlier, officer in charge of training wing, and my the training wing office was in Tetron Bay. In fact, that night at um, Colonel, Chris, uh, Colonel Johnson's home, we had changed command. Because I was a professional soldier, I was given command of Bravo Company, and Major Luke was then sent from Tetron Bay, where he was, to the take over the volunteer company, which was my other one of my other duties. So he was stationed at Camp Ogden then from then on, and I was to be in Tetron Bay with the operational arm, Bravo Company, back with Wendell and Company. <laughs> uh, okay, where was I? Yeah. I also met um, Sergeant Spencer in that office. Major Luke handed over to me. Well, uh, you know, Army, we have to hand over, take over. You have to sign documents, sign. He took over the army, signed the papers, and so we had a hand over, take over. And um, he said he was in a hurry to leave and wanted the ammunition for Delta Company, which he, which he had taken over from me also for the operation. Well, the company, the company, the company volunteers. I sent a message to Lance Corporal Stevenson, who was the ammunition storeman, and Private Roberts. And not seeing them, I went outside looking for them. I met Roberts with my vehicle in the area of headquarters company office, and shortly after saw Stevenson in the area of the orderly room. I called to him, and he came, up, came after going into the orderly room. I questioned him about the keys, which I saw in his hands, and he said that they were the duplicate keys kept by the adjutant for the bunker, and that he had been instructed to go to the bunker by the adjutant, Lieutenant Bernard, to issue ammunition. Now, um, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I was, the, I was the person responsible for the bunker, and I had the main bunker keys. The duplicate keys were kept by the adjutant and should be locked in the adjutant safe, never to be touched, unless I said so, the commanding officer. You know, and so this is mentioned here just to show that there was some kind of movements going on as you say in both. Um, I instructed him to return those keys and on his return to me I would give him my keys with the ammunition along with Private Roberts. As Lance Corporal Stevenson left, Captain Halfay came up to me and asked about ammunition for C Company, his company. And I also let him let him have my vehicle. C Company, in fact, was the guard company looking after the president's house and what have you, doing duty front. And they were stationed at Camp Ogden with Delta Company. I decided to um, ha let him have the, the, ve the vehicle and further requested that he take D Company volunteer ammunition as Major Luke was in a hurry. Major Luke was informed and he left. By this time, Stevenson had returned and he went off with Captain Halfway, Private Roberts, Lance Corporal Spencer, and another soldier to the bunk of ammunition. They were all in my vehicle. I went into my office where Captain Spencer and Lieutenant Vidal were sitting. I inquired of Lieutenant Shah, but neither did you know we knew where he was. I decided to brief them on the situation, and as I was halfway through, Shah arrived in his car. I called him out of his car and went over the briefing for his benefit. I told Lieutenant Shah where the commanding officer had, had um, commanded him to go and the other officers. And as I was through, Lieutenant Shah got into his car and was leaving. I inquired of him where he was going. He said to the officer's mess. So I asked, I told him I would go with him. As I hadn't slept that night, <laughs> and I wanted to go to the officer's mess to get my usual coffee. You know, I needed really coffee. He agreed to take me. I joined him in the car, and we went directly to the officer's mess. Going along the path to the mess, we met um, Lieutenant Bazi coming from the mess. I spoke to him, telling him that I thought he was on his way to, to, to Tobago by now, because he had been stationed to go to Tobago. He said that he was leaving, leaving. Shah then told Daz, Bazi that he wanted to speak to him. And I left them outside the mess and went inside where I ordered coffee. About five minutes later, while I was in the mess, 
my vehicle drove into the compound of, with Private Roberts driving along with Captain Halfine and left him in Vidal. The last name got out. Um, um, speaking, shouting from the officer's mess, I inquired of the bunker keys. Captain Halfine said that he, he got only C Company's ammunition and that he had left Stevenson at the bunker with the keys. I told her if I had to get the company's ammunition and bring the keys to me. And both Harfite and Vida left. I went back into the mess and some minutes later heard a shot followed by another. When I heard the first one, I got up and went outside. By that time there was a second shot. When I saw Corporal Donner, who he was in mess orderly, um, <laughs> was looking in the direction of the, of the gunshot report. I asked him if it was an accidental discharge and he said he saw men running. I joined, um, I joined Corporal Donovan where he was and saw men running in the direction of the company's office, that's my office. I took up my cap and started to run down to the office. I was picked up by Sergeant Doldron in a three-wheel vehicle, which I was trying to find out where it was, and it was too, in front of the church, and taken to the area outside Captain Mader's office. Captain Mader was the principal of the regimental institute, that's called PRI. He's the man in charge of canteens and all of that. And his office is right next to the, well, B Company, my office, and the orderly room. I saw Major Christopher, the second in command, holding Lieutenant Shah by his shirt collar and right hand from behind. Everyone seemed slightly shaken as there was a crowd of soldiers that gathered. I offered my services to take Shah to the guard room as I concluded he was under arrest. I accompanied Major Christopher to the guard room with Lieutenant Shah. At the guard room, Shah was searched by Captain Harford and myself and placed in a cell. Corporal Ancaster was the Provo Marshal on duty. Major Christopher then turned to Lieutenant Shah in my presence and that of Corporal Lancaster, as Captain Harfile had remained outside and said, Mr. Shah, you really would have shot me? Shah replied, I missed you, sir, but I'll kill you yet. You'll see. Then I said to Shah, Rafik, are you serious? You must be mad. Shah did not reply. I left the guard room with Major Christopher and walked back to the area of the, the um, body room. On the way there, I was asked permission. I asked permission to arrest Lieutenant Lassar. I made this request out of a pre, out of precaution by reason of my prior information, and I expected a chain reaction. Major Christopher did not reply directly, but said something referenced that there would be a third one in the cell before long. I proceeded to carry out my arrest, and on reaching outside the PRI's office, I left Major Christopher and asked the whereabouts of Lieutenant Glassard. I got no reply, but someone pointed to the PRI's office. I went to his outer office and I was told something. I pushed the door to Captain Major's office and saw Lieutenant LaSalle sitting facing me. I entered the office. I saw Major sitting behind the desk to the right of LaSalle. I told Lieutenant LaSalle he was under arrest and that he should accompany to the guard room. He got up and I instructed him to remove his belt, which he did, and handed it to me. He then proceeded me out of the office. What is it? And on reaching outside, I saw Lieutenant Hull, Bernard, Vidal, and my vehicle with Private Roberts. Roberts is my driver, right? You'll hear his name often. I inquired why they were still there, but without awaiting a reply, I instructed Lieutenant Hull and Captain Major to accompany Lieutenant Lastal as a coach to the guard room in my vehicle and place him in a cell. I began to inquire what happened, at, as at that time I knew nothing of what occurred in front of the audio room earlier. I noticed Captain Spencer for the first time in all this commotion. He co complained of an injury to his hand and told me something. Now, told me 
that Lieutenant Shah had pointed an SLR, the self-loading rifle, at Major Christopher, who was standing outside the orderly room. And he had grabbed the rifle barrel to stop him shooting Major Christopher. The rifle went off and burnt his hand. That is the muzzle flash, if you understand when the thing is the, it's very hot and burnt his hand. So and that is what went on. That's what um that is what that is what um oh, Captain Spencer told me. When, within a few minutes after I'm um, speaking with Captain Spencer, a soldier, I think it was um, Corporal Simon, came running to me and said, they have taken over the bunker. I rushed to my armory, got my rifle, and ran back outside telling Corporal Simon to ring the gate and stop Captain Halfay. Because, remember we had rifles with no ammo. Eh? I, I, I hope that at that time, um, half I would have all the ammo. I knew he had C companies ammo in the vehicle at least. So that I could get ammunition from him. As the only ammunition available at the camp was at the bunker. <laughs> I then set out for the guard room and met the weapon training warrant officer, um, Hazel, and Sergeant Miles, coming from the direction of the sergeant's mess. and inform them that the bunker had been taken and to stop Captain Halfay to get the ammunition he had with him. They also drew two L2A2s from the ammunition from the our stores. Well, L2A2s are automatic arm rifles actually. Um, so so that we, when we got the ammunition, we figured we could do something. I then went down to the guard room where I left, met Lieutenant Nader, Lieutenant Hull, and later saw Lieutenant Walker. I was told um, by Lieutenant Hull that the, um, that the people had taken over the bunker and that there were people, soldiers up at the bunker. I looked up in the direction of the bunker and saw a vehicle and figures in uniform lined up facing the bunker wall. Their hands were up and they were leaning against the bunker wall. There were other soldiers with rifles standing in the on guard position covering the figures lined up against the wall with their rifles. I further recognized Lieutenant Vidal in his audio officer's uniform, he was the audio officer leader, standing to one side with his hands down. I saw Lieutenant Bazi dressed in a parachute smock waving his hands about, apparently giving instruction. I could not hear what he was saying, but I was sure it was him by his bearing, as I had been associated with him for his entire service in the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment. In fact, he was one of my, my pets. <laughs> when I said, one of the soldiers, I, the officers I looked after a lot. I did not recognize any of the other soldiers, neither did I see Captain Hart. I saw Lieutenant Bazi leave the bunker and start towards the general camp area. I, I then became aware of shots being fired in my direction, the direction of the guard room and the sentry box where I was standing. A little before this, while I'd been there standing, talking to Hull and so forth, um, Captain Spencer had come up um, and asked permission to leave to go because of his hand. Also, I told him, I said, look, take Bazi, um, Lieutenant Vidal's red sports car, drive over to the Coast Guard and inform them of what was going on and ask for SNU, this is Gaylord's people, to come with ammunition for us, come and help. Right? I don't know what went on, you'll hear that, what went on which is in Gaylord's book, the close, the, a close run thing. I have to show what went on at that stage over there, I went over later. These shots that were being fired were fired by soldiers who were moving very slowly in my direction along the grass strip above the parade square. Now remember I told Julian to go and I thought maybe ammunition might be coming back. I was hanging around waiting for that. 
there were approximately 10 soldiers. I did not at, at the time recognize any of the soldiers in the area of the bunker. There were about five under, under guard and about six soldiers with rifles. At this stage, there were soldiers running all over the place. Some running in the barrack room and some running out. Some running in the MI room and some running out. Now, if all you know the geography of Tetron Bay, the, the MI room is about 75 yards to the north if you want to go out of um, the guard room. I got inside the guard room and Lieutenant Vidal joined me there. I did not see how Vidal got there, but I inquired and how he got away and he said he was released. Um, shortly after he said, look, he asked me if he could leave to go and change his change into a battle order, whatever it is. And I said, right, go ahead, you are doing nothing here, you're not helping anybody. So he walk, started to walk out of the camp going up towards the, up to the crow's nest, up the hill. Looking out the guard room window, I saw Private Haynes running from the direction of the bunker to the MI room. This is only about 75 yards from the guard room. He had a rifle and a small pack. Rifle fire was then concentrated on the guard room. Louvers were being broken and rifle shots were coming through the wall. These shots were coming from the same group that was approaching from the parade square. I looked through the guard room window and in the forefront of the approaching soldiers' rifles, I saw Private Guy F, who was in the act of pointing his rifle at the guard room and firing. I did not recognize anyone else. Um, Lieutenant, um, anyone else? Lieutenant LaSalle and Shah were still locked in the cells and the Provo, Corporal Lancaster and uh, and Private Bazi, not Corporal Bazi, Private, Private Bazi, also a provo, were at the sentry box near the guard room. I realized the situation that the position was hopeless and told um, Lieutenant Sol and Major, who were also with me in the guard room, that they should try to escape. I waited my chance and as soon as there was a break in the firing, I ran out of the guard room and got just past the sentry box before the rifle shots were directed at me. I made my way up the hill using the angle, angle of fire to best advantage. I later met Vidal at the top of the hill by crow's nest. The officers, other officers did not come along with me and from information subsequently they were, they were captured. Meeting Lieutenant Vidal, he and I were on our way to Coast Guard and just as we got together at near Crow's Nest, I saw the Coast Guard boat which fired about three shells into Tetron Bay in the area above the bunker. Vidal and I continued into Stobel's Bay where we reported to um, Captain Bloom. There was an issue of ammunition and he suggested that we use the Coast Guard bus to block the road from Tetron to avoid them coming out in transport and that we shoot over their heads with the, the bofers to scare them. The families in the area were evacuated as Lieutenant Commander Williams, as M. Williams, and Major Luke's families. They were living at Crow's Nest, just about by Crow's Nest. It was further decided that we would, be, would, be, we would evacuate Stobel's Bay if they got past the roadblock and that we would try to blow the road below the Coast Guard station to prevent the exit by transport. That was done by um, Commander Gaylord Kelshaw here and his SNU people. But while all this was going on with us, they were busy trying to make sure nobody could go further than Coast Guard. I organized the defenses with men who had come from Tetron Bay. Some swam, some came over the hills, and also with some Coast Guard personnel. I issued them with arms. Lieutenant Walker, who came over the hill, also joined us. He was injured, suffering a, a wound in his hand. Apparently, when he was running to Bobico, he went straight over the hill from Tetron. He got um, shot in his hand, in the back of his hand. 
Yeah. In fact, I gave him my pistol when we were at school because I had my rifle and all that. Shortly after this, the Bofas started firing. I was, I was still in Tetron. The rebels were coming from Tetron with transport. I saw that there were soldiers in file, approximately 20 in number, followed by a bus load of soldiers, followed by a truck. It is possible that it was more vehicles, but I could not see, as the road there is screened by the trees. The Bofa fire was directed in the hill above the road. The rebels turned back, the vehicles reversing up the hill and out of sight. A period of about 20 minutes elapsed during which we tried to sort out the confusion with refugees coming from Tetron over around the coast and over the hill, most of them unarmed. An order came to evacuate as the rebels were coming along the road with civilians in front of them as a screen. I was the last to leave and looking on the road, I saw about 10 persons in civilian clothes three of which were by the clothing women. Intermingled with them were soldiers. Following them was a bus filled with troops, and behind them were two trucks. I cannot say what was in the trucks as they were covered. Soldiers were also leaning on the front portion of the truck and walking alongside the truck. The Coast Guard then started to fire bofers at the hill past the Coast Guard station in an effort to block the road. At the commencement of the fire, the rebels stopped and eventually turned back. I was then taken by Coast Guard boat to Queen's Wharf and was later transported to the Governor General's room. From there, I left for police headquarters with the commander where I acted as the battle agitator. Now that was Colonel, and those, at that time it was still Colonel um, Johnson. Now I'm going to stop there because it's time for Wendell here to take over. He was in Tetron Bay throughout. And you will hear, if he doesn't tell you, I will tell you what the heroic thing he did. You've got about 10 medals. Right. Thank you. Lobo, Lobo, Lobo. You have nine lives, my dear. That was a very informative piece.